we hope to have a very insightful i hope that it will be brief but extremely important assignment this morning uh, probably eating into the afternoon and uh, we will crave your indulgence if we get that far we have a very important assignment today and if you are privileged to be in this auditorium you have been carefully selected for that purpose uh, your input to be of significant use to this country of ours. At this moment, we are going to invite the Executive Director of uh, Africa Center for Energy Policy to give us the opening remarks. Let's put our hands together and welcome Mr. Benjamin Boache. Good morning, um, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we appreciate your time uh, here with us uh, this morning uh, to discuss very important um, issues for our country. I think people have been calling me wondering uh, what ISEP has to do with procurement and why we stopped working on energy. Um, but it's important to state that uh, fiscal governance and ensuring prudent utilization of our resources is the last mile of what we do at our center. And whether it's resource revenue uh, from petroleum or um, solid minerals, the state benefits and how that benefit is utilized is also extremely uh, important uh, for us. But the fact that we own resources, not because somebody is smart or somebody is more capable, the fact that we occupy the land called Ghana, the country receives close to 10 billion Ghana cities a year from the extraction of resources. The worst we can do with our resources is to let the people feel how the revenue is utilized. And that is why we are doing this, to ensure that the expenditure of the outcome of those resources are better utilized. Beyond that, the sustainable approach to governance is to ensure that beyond relying on natural resources, we are able to incentivize our people to contribute to development by paying their taxes and ensuring that each other uh, contributes to development. And the way to encourage people to do that is to be optimal and efficient in the utilization of the revenues uh, that come in. So together with the money, we have taken a hard look at that last mile to see how we are faring and whether or not we cannot improve uh, as a country to ensure that we're using the revenues to develop uh, the country. And I'm grateful that we have esteemed guests with us uh, to dissect the issues and help our country redefine a path um, that optimizes resources uh, for the benefit of the average uh, Ghanaian uh, on the street. So on behalf of Imani, the Africa Center for Energy Policy, uh, I want to welcome you and encourage you to contribute uh, to this discussion so that all of us can take the issue of procurement really seriously uh, for the good of our country. Thank you very much. Let's do it better for him. The Executive Director, Africa Center for Energy Policy, now that we have been I uh, told the reason why we are here. I would introduce some of the institutions that are also present and uh, possibly introduce some uh, individuals that uh, we also recognize in our midst. But I'll start with myself. My name is Samuel Ajiman, and uh, I'm a journalist. I also lead a team that is propagating the Continental Free Trade Agreement and the area, if you want to put it that way as well. I will try and steer the affairs of this morning towards the directions that I have been given. 
Also, we have here present Ministry of Food and Agriculture, the African Center for Energy Policy, Africa Education Watch, the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, the Public Procurement Authority, the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply, the European Union is also present here, the Executive Director Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition is one of our special and distinguished individuals who have also joined us in this auditorium this morning. My colleague media practitioners are also here and uh, my former police Metro Television is present, Daily Graphic is present, Ghanaian Times is present, the CTTV is here, TV3 is here, Asasi Radio is also here and quite a number of others that uh, and I see, I recognize my senior colleague uh, from Joy, Atukwame Nadadzi, is also at the back there. The same way, ladies and gentlemen, as we have been hinted, a very significant assignment we have this morning, and uh, we are going to delve into a particular research outcome, research and reports that we, uh, the folks at Imani, the folks at Africa Center for Energy Policy have been able to put together. This is going to drive the conversation that we have today is going to serve as a basis uh, for which we are going to engage this morning on behalf of our country. It is important that we get to know the content of what has been found through that research and the presentation is going to be done by a research consultant with Imani, uh, my brother Dennis Asari. Let's put our hands together and welcome him for that presentation. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Sami. So we have gathered here this morning to discuss an issue that is very critical to Ghana's economic development. And it is an established fact that the only surest pathway that countries can convert public spending to development outcomes is to develop a robust, competitive, transparent, and accountable procurement system. And so the World Bank estimates that in sub-Saharan African countries, they spend about 15% of their GDP on public procurement. If you look at the last six years, Ghana's expenditure items, you see that if you take out compensation and interest payment, all the next line items that are spent through procurement constitute averagely about 10% or 10 to 11% of our GDP. And all of these are spent through public procurement. So the extent to which this procurement system delivers efficiency and value for money is very critical. So as a country in 2001, when we did the country financial management review program and the procurement review assessment, we decided that we want to develop a public procurement system that is accountable, transparent, and competitive. So we developed a lot of um, legal reforms, um, structural regimes, established the PPA, all directed at enhancing the public procurement system because it was identified as a higher risk to public spending. In spite of all of these reforms, in the last 10 years, the Auditor General estimated that irregularities associated to procurement is estimated around 143 million Ghana cities. That is the case of the ministries, departments, and agencies. If you look at the public boards and corporations, the Auditor General estimates about 1.04 billion cities lost through irregularities. And these are huge sums of monies that are not accounted for. So what we sought to understand is that is Ghana's public procurement system saving the public purse or it is hurting it? Looking at the numerous reforms we have implemented over the years and how we are not seeing an effective reduction in the losses or irregularities associated with procurement. So that was the purpose of this assignment, to understand why are these irregularities happening in spite of the reforms that we have implemented. So we will delve into the research by just looking at a brief context of where we have come from as a country, the procurement irregularities trend, the methods that we're able to identify down to the barriers to effective public procurement in Ghana through our key informant engagement that we conducted. So historically, Ghana's public procurement system has been marked by a lot of challenges, even including corruption, political interference, insider manipulation, 
and challenges with value for money and accountability, particularly because before 2003, government purchasing and spending were all centralized around a single agency. So if you trace our history from the Public Works Department, Ghana National Construction Company, Ghana Supply Company, down to the Ghana National Procurement Authority, uh, Agency, it was centered around a single institution. So it opened the system for abuse, interference, and that affected accountability and transparency. So in 2003, we decided that we were going to pass a legislation that will establish a more robust and competitive procurement system. In 2016, that legal regime was also amended to include more other um, modern strategies that can enhance accountability and the strength of oversight in our public procurement. Fast forward in 2014, we also conceptualized under the World Bank e-transform project that we want to digitize our procurement system. So we looked at or we conceptualized the Ghana electronic procurement system using a $97 million US, uh, US dollar facility to set up this project. So as of now, it's estimated about 430 public institutions are enrolled on this electronic procurement system. Notwithstanding all of these measures, what we have seen is that if you look at the Auditor General's assessment of public institutions, pub, uh, procurement irregularities has, have, uh, have recorded some relatively higher um, numbers or high, that we've seen an increase in public procurement in Ghana. So what that means is that the reforms that we are implementing are not directly translating into minimizing procurement irregularities or ensuring efficiency and accountability. And over the period two, we've seen public procurement being marked or characterized by some sort of corruption, political interference, and insider manipulation. So for us to carefully understand how far we have come, so we looked at the last 10 years. If you look at the procurement trend for ministries, departments, and agencies, you see that the highest level of irregularities, when, and we adjusted these to inflation, so you've taken care of the effect of inflation on the irregularities. Over the period, we recorded the highest number of procurement irregularities between 2015 and 2017. In fact, the Auditor General estimates that in the last 10 years, the 143 million Ghana cities associated with procurement irregularities 115 million of that occurred between 2016 and 2020. So you see that the highest uh, numbers of irregularities were recorded between tw starting from 2014 just to 2017. It declined in 2018 and picked up again. One, another uh, findings you also identified is that periods before and before, during and after election years too, recorded some relatively higher procurement irregularities. And this can be attributed to the fact that Prior to elections, governments are more likely to implement different programs that are not reconfigured to suit the existing procurement of the public institutions. So that may lead to some losses. Aside that, there was also clear abuse of the law even within this same period, leading to the irregularities. But the trend is even much clearer when you look at the public boss and corporation situation. You see, it rises up in 2012, declines, and in 2016, and rises sharply again in 2020. And all these periods to are election years. So although not empirically proven, we are, we, are, we are confident that periods before and during elections, we are more likely to record procurement irregularities or higher volumes because of the rush in, in, in the implementation of government programs during that period. The sub rise in 2020, which we estimate to be about 42% of our additional COVID-19 spending of about $2 billion in 2020, can be attributed to the uh, cost or the procurement during the pandemic. Uh, beyond the increased spending during that period, we also recorded some of the highest form of abuse of the procurement law during the same period, according to the Auditor General. So, Imani and SF seek to achieve three main purposes. We, before we understand how the procurement system has fared over the years, we need to conduct an evidence-based assessment of how public institutions are procuring. What methods are, or what are the most preferred methods for them? Why are they choosing those methods? Then again, for us to understand the industry very well, we also conducted some interviews with key experts and heads of institutions to get a clear understanding of the factors affecting effective procurement in the country. The overarching aim of all of these activities is to ensure that we recommend some politically feasible reforms to addressing the challenges to our public procurement in Ghana. 
So that's how we went about the work. We relied greatly on the Auditor General's report from 2010 to 2020. So we reviewed the Auditor General's report on procurement irregularities of all MDAs and public boards and corporations, looking at their sector ministries. And we rank their procurement irregularities based on their contribution to the composite procurement irregularity over the period. And out of the ranking, we're able to select 11 MDAs. And these 11 MDAs, their irregularities in the last 10 years constitute over 95% of the irregularities recorded over the period. And also eight um, sector ministries that has public boards and corporations were also used. Then again, for us to understand how these public institutions were procuring, we relied on information on the PPS website under the contract section. So we tracked the transactions of these sector ministries and public boards and corporations over the period based on the amount of information that is disclosed on the PPU website. And we were able to come up with 1,171 procurement transactions of the 11 MDAs and the eight public boards and cooperation sector ministries. We also conducted key informant interviews to give more flesh to the statistical analysis that we, had, uh, we were able to come up with. So we start with a common method of procurement. So if you take the ministries, department, and agencies, what we found was that we were able to identify 339 procurement transactions or contracts on the PPA website. Now out of that, you see that significant number of that were procured through open tender and relatively higher numbers through single sourcing and some small through um, some small number through restricted tender. So you can clearly say that in terms of method, it appears that the common method of public of the eleven public institutions that we looked at swings in favor of open competitive tender. But to critically understand the dynamics of the information that we track, we also delve deeper into what is the financial value of these transactions. And out of the 339 transaction, the total financial value was estimated around 19.7 billion cities. And out of the 19.7 billion, 18.7 was transacted through single sourcing. So while it appears that in terms of method, it swings in favor of open competitive tender, when it comes to the financial value of the transactions, it is more in favor of what single sourcing. So we can confidently say that public, the 11 MDS that we looked at are more likely to use non-competitive methods, that is the single sourcing, as um, a method for contracting higher financial value uh, projects or uh, goods, works, or servicing. And just a little over a billion was transacted through open tender. So by method, the open tender is common, but in terms of financial value of the transaction, it is swing more in favor of single sourcing. Then we looked at the public boards and corporations of the eight sector ministries. We were able to identify 832 transactions. And out of the 832 transactions, more than half was transacted through open tender, a significant number through single sourcing, and relatively smaller through restricted tender. But when you delve deeper into the financial value of that transaction, you see that the financial value of the restricted tender contract is about twice of the open tender. So that it establishes a fact that public institutions or the 11 MDAs and the eight public boards and co corporation sector ministries are more likely to use non-competitive methods or the single sourcing and restricted tender for high financial value contracts. But we also take cognizance of the fact that these methods are mostly used for goods, service, and works where the suppliers are very few. And these um, such transactions may come at a premium. So the financial values are likely to, to be high. But that notwithstanding, these methods appear to be, the restricted tender and the single sourcing, appear to be the dominant method for public institutions when the financial value is high. For us to understand, because when you, because looking at the high financial values or trans, uh, values of the transactions procured through this non-competitive method, it is imperative for us to understand whether they are complying with what the law says. That is the circumstances and the grounds under which you can use this method. Before I go there, one thing that we identified was that most of the institutions that we were looking at were not disclosing their transactions. So for example, we, if you take the case of the Ministry of Justice and Attorney General, as at this morning where we still verified again, only one transaction has been published by that uh, institution on the contract section. 
If you take the Ministry of Interior, only two transactions are there. So what that clearly means is that they are not being, or they are not opening themselves to, uh, to or they are not opening themselves for accountability. So as citizens like myself and you, we are unable to tell whether these public institutions are complying with the PPA law or they are abusing it. Because if they disclose the transactions, we will then be able to map the transactions against the method and what the law requires and ascertain whether we are achieving value for money, whether our system is transparent or accountable. But without such a disclosure, we can't hold public institutions accountable. Beyond the non-disclosure, one thing that we also identified was that we looked at the justification for using the non-competitive methods, that is the single sourcing and the restricted tender. When you look at the justification based on the contract section that we looked at, in most cases, the public institutions were not providing any reason for using that method. So the law requires that when you choose, for example, single sourcing, there are certain circumstances that should be met. If they disclose to the PPA without publishing it, that one we cannot tell. And as demand side actors, we rely on disclosure to hold public institutions accountable. And in most cases, this the public boss, in the case of public boss and corporations, they were not disclosing the reasons for doing that. So you and I cannot tell whether the huge financial values that we see, the conditions under which those activities were contracted, merited or merit the method that was used. And it is hard for us to hold them accountable if we want to progress and ensure transparency and efficiency of our procurement system. Beyond the non-disclosure of reason, one major factor that was also highly cited was proprietary and urgency. But it was also discouraging to find out that most of these transactions we looked out for, the extent to which research, promotion, development, and policy influenced the choice of non-competitive method was very low. Even in the case of the MBAs, it was zero, based on the transactions that we looked at. So we tried to delve deeper to look at the Auditor General's assessment what has been the main reasons for the irregularities consistently occurring? So we looked at the Auditor General's report from 2010 to 2020, and we highlighted the reasons for each institution. And nine out of 10 cases, the main reason for the irregularity was non-compliance with the PPA law or abuse of the PPA law. So what that means is that some public institutions are advertently or inadvertently not complying with the law or abusing the law and nothing is happening. And to illustrate that, we have some case studies that I will show. Another problem that we also identified was weak contract management and storekeeping practices, where sometimes we pay for a particular service, but the uh, service is not delivered, or we even overstock supply of certain items and they are not used and we waste money. Now, to start with, we look at recent cases, that is between 2015 and 2020. If you look at the case of the Bost Head Office Complex transaction, Bost awarded a contract in June 2015 to Roleda Company to build their office complex. But if you look at the Auditor General's report on this transaction, they realized that Bost awarded the contract before seeking PPA approval using single sourcing. But the law said that you will seek approval before using that method. And that is a clear breach of the law. And as of now, there are no publicly verifi verifiable evidence of sanctions method to bust. Another factor, too, is that when they then sought approval from the PPA, the PPA even recommended them to use restricted tender. So if they had sought express approval before awarding the contract, perhaps the method the PPA approved for them could have brought the final cost of the transaction lower uh, or, or brought the price down. So when public institutions decide not to comply with the law, one of the effects is that we may see contract overpricing, and before we can even tell that this contract has been overpriced, they must disclose, and they are not disclosing. So it makes the accountability work difficult. Another issue too is that in the law, the law prescribes that when you choose to <coughs> do a tender through, restricted, uh, through the restricted tender approach, you must also publish in the bulletin, and we relied on the e-bulletin. So we looked at the publication in the e-bulletin from January to December 2015, and we didn't find this bust transaction in it. And when you search on the PPA website, this is the feedback that you see. So we are unable to tell whether bust complied with this regulation in the PPA law, and if they did not comply, why are there not publicly verifiable sanctions against bust? 
The next case study is the case of the Ghana Maritime Authority. So in the law, the, the fifth shadow also prescribes certain thresholds where you can use a particular method. So in the case of goods, that is in yellow, when it goes beyond 100,000, then you should use competitive tender. It is below that you can use the request for um, the, the price quotations. But we realized that over the period, Ghana Maritime Authority undertook six, eight transactions worth 1.3 million Ghana cities using the wrong method. And this is captured in the Auditor General's report in 2020. And so you see that because they chose the wrong method, it, it suggests that perhaps these financial values have been overpriced, overly stated, or we didn't get the right value for the service that was, de uh, that was delivered because the method that they used was wrong. If they had used a competitive tender, maybe you could have uh, gotten a much uh, relatively lower price. Similarly, in the case of the Ghana Port and Harbor Authority, we identified nine different transactions that was also captured in the Auditor General's report to the tune of 6.3 million Ghana cities that were transacted through these non-competitive methods, single sourcing and restraint tender without the PPA's approval. So it clearly uh, uh, directs to the point that some public institutions are clearly abusing the PPA law and we are not seeing any sanctions to that. So it's creating some culture of tolerance for abuse of the PPA law in Ghana. Beyond that, we also looked at the contract management issues and storekeeping. One case study we also identified is that in 2017, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, the Riyadh office, in terms of getting a residency, had paid $60,000 for the construction to Glinko Construction Company. If you look at the report of the Auditor General on this transaction, the contract was awarded to a company that was not registered. The contract was awarded on the 3rd of January 2017, but the company was registered after, uh, that is on the 7th, of January. And the law says that you cannot award a contract to an unregistered company. And this is a clear breach or poor, other poor contract management practice or a deliberate abuse of the law. And in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs response to the Auditor General, they mentioned that they have no idea of this company and the transaction. But the Auditor General provides evidence of this amount of money paid into a Royal Bank account. So another point that we also identify is that if you look at the case of the Controller and Accountant General, they were purchasing value books consistently that the MDAs were not using. And the Auditor General between 2000 and 2009 found almost 10 million value books worth 17 million Ghana cities that remained unused and wasting in the storehouses. Again, they also identified that some 14 million booklets procured for ministries and departments that were not being used, estimated at a price of 21.5 million Ghana cities were not being used, and it's creating a financial loss of about 39 million Ghana cities. And these are all from the Auditor General's report. So we see abuse of the law, weak and ineffective contract management, combining to affect the effectiveness of our uh, public procurement system. Beyond this, we try to also look at how is our public procurement institutionally structured? Does it allow or lend itself to be effective, accountable, and transparent? So you look at the core influence dynamics of the public procurement system. So right from the top, we looked at how people are appointed into the PPE. And you see that there's a clear excessive control of the executive over the public procurement authority. The board of the PPA is appointed by the president. The chief executive is appointed by the president. And that gives some sort of control of the executive over the authority itself. Again, the sector minister in charge of the PPA also, the Ministry of Finance, is appointed by the president. The heads of entity, majority of these public institutions are also appointed by the president. So looking at how procurement systems are vulnerable to abuse. If we subject our public procurement system to excessive influence of the political economy, then that would affect our work towards achieving transparency and accountability. And at the lower end too, we see much more influence of the head, heads of entity over the entity tender committee and even the evaluation panel. Similarly, if you look at the regional tender review committee, some of the people who sit on these committees too are also appointed by the president. So if you look at how the procurement system is structured and the core influence dynamics, it is very vulnerable to abuse or it can be influenced by politically exposed persons. We also look at how some of these safeguards have been structured. 
So you look at, we pick the case of ETC for the uh, ministry department agencies. And if you look at the entity tender committee, there are about nine members on the committee, and we realize that six of them are part of the institution. Looking at how high financial value transactions are being procured through non-competitive measure, you will need a very independent body, in, uh, an in, uh, a body independent of the institution to hold them to account and to ensure that they comply with the law. Now, we look at the ETC, and this is this, the chair of the ETC, the head of the entity, is part of the institution, head of finance. The attorney general is a public um, servant, three heads of department, the chief director, and two members of professional groups. These two people cannot ensure the level of accountability that we are looking for, looking at the fact that they are overly powered. But one thing that was striking, too, is that public procurement officers in these public institutions, too, appear to be very powerless because from the institutional architecture and the uh, organizational structure of public institutions, they do not have decision-making power. So they sit on the committees and can only make suggestions but cannot compel the institution to either stop a transaction or adopt a different approach. So that also exposes our public procurement system to a lot of risk and something small on the core influence dynamics. In recent times, we've seen politically exposed persons talk about how government should award contracts to party faithfuls. And when you get such influential people getting into public procurement space, you ask yourself, when their businesses are involved, what kind of method will be used for contracting such projects or goods and services? And we've seen public, uh, politically exposed persons who do not see conflict of interest as a problem, and that they believe that they should be entitled to some procurement contracts from the government. Beyond what we identified in the Auditor General's report and our core influence dynamic analysis, we also engage a lot of key experts in the space to understand from their perspective what are the drivers of the irregularities. And the most important thing that comes up is lack of enforcement of the PPA law. So the PPA law is not being enforced and nothing seems to be happening. And one of the reasons why nothing is happening is that the sanctions regime or we are not applying the sanctions. And this is captured in an article of the former Public Accounts Committee chair that we find the irregularities, we identify the people involved, but we are always not ready to apply the sanctions. So lack of application of the sanctions in the PPA Act is one of the main cause of the uh, challenges to procurement in Ghana. There are other issues with oversight, weak oversight by Parliament as well. If you look at the pu Public Accounts Committee and even the structure of the Audit Review Implementation Committee too, doesn't lend itself to hold the institutions accountable. Another issue too is weak internal audit system. So in this public institution, there are internal auditors who also have responsibility to ensure efficiency in spending of public funds. But what we identified was that at the time of the study, we found that the internal auditors in the agencies cannot stop transactions even on the gift miss. So they see transactions happening, particularly for the procure to pay method that we identified, that public institutions are spending money on the gift miss through procurement, but they do not have the right to stop it. So their job has become more like firefighting. They come in when the thing has already been contracted uh, or someone has already committed government. So they are unable to act proactively as the law requires them to do. Another issue that also we also identified was the weak regulatory oversight. So we see the PPA to have that sort of oversight responsibility on public procurement. And the PPA's work has become relatively difficult because there are more than 500 public institutions and monitoring all of their procurement transaction is a big task. So they try to use the electronic platform. Despite spending $97 million on the Ghana National Ghana Electronic Procurement System, as of now, 76% of public institutions do not use the platform. And this was also reported and even stated by a PPA official at a recent event by Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition that despite how much they've spent on the platform, 76% of public institutions were not using it. And 430 institutions have been trained to use the uh, electronic procurement platform. But one question too is that if they are not using it and it's not even compulsory by law and you want to incentivize them, why is the PPA consistently approving transactions that are conducted manually? Because if you want to incentivize the use of these electronic platforms, then there should be measures to drive them to use that. Another 
Issue two was the weak safeguards. I've already mentioned one of the safeguards, that's the ETC, and the other internal controls that are supposed to work effectively are not functioning well. One last point that came out very strongly too is the absence of standards, ethics, and professionalism in the practice of procurement in Ghana. So currently, we do not have a nationally recognized institution or organization training procurement officials. So one question you ask is that, how do people get into procurement and act as procurement officers in public institutions? It is hard to understand. And because there are no professionally, re nationally recognized professional institution doing that, it is hard to hold them to standards. So if a procurement officer is not complying with the law or is involved in an irregularity, how do you hold them accountable? We've seen a proliferation of such agencies. We have the CIPS, that's the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. There's the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply. But these have not been well harmonized. So people are practicing procurement, but there are no standardized ethics holding them to practice. All of these issues combine to affect effectiveness of our procurement system, leading to the increased procurement irregularities that we saw in the beginning slide. So what we are saying is that if we should continue on business as usual, then the public procurement system is going to hurt the public purse and cannot save it. And this is because the whole architecture, that's the oversight, have been compromised, and the institutional architecture have been compromised by weak effectiveness of oversight and lack of ethical standards of behavior. Again, there's also some sort of excessive political influence over the work of the PPE that makes it very difficult for you to achieve accountability. So what we recommend is that just a brief summary of our recommendation is that for the PPA to effectively monitor and perform its oversight function well, then it should be made mandatory or composed for public institutions to use the electronic procurement system. In that way, the PPA can have some 360 round oversight over what public institutions are doing. Then what we also care is that people engaging in transactions that are not approved by the PPA, they can see it before it, uh, people commit government to contract. Again, the electronic procurement system and the gift mist can be integrated so that whatever is happening there can be seen on the gift mist. And when we do that, we should strengthen or empower our internal auditors to have full access when they see a transaction to be suspicious, to stop it before it actually occurs. Then again, the Financial Administration Act uh, makes provision for the establishment of a financial administration court that would look critically into the outcomes of audit reviews. That court is yet to be set up, but the Chief Justice then set up the Financial and Economic uh, Crime Court. That also include procurement irregularities identified, but that court is still not being utilized for procurement issues. Again, we, the PPA must work with the various independent professional bodies to come together, come, come together and form or either a nationally recognized institute or a codified standards of ethics to guide the practice of procurement officers in the organization. And again, in 2017, we identified that a due diligence unit was established at the PPA to monitor some of these transactions that public institutions engage in. The due diligence unit must be empowered for them to critically even look at the non-competitive methods, looking at the high financial values that go into these methods to ensure that if a, a, a public institution decides to use these non-competitive methods, they are complying strictly to what the law requires. And when we do that, we are likely to move forward and ensure some transparency and accountability in our procurement system. Thank you very much.